in the unknown and the potential dangers inherent in every new event. The magical child is allowed open interaction, free of concern for value or utility. This is possible only because the parents assume responsibility for his or her survival. They believe that it would be better for the child to enter his or her inheritance with some physical damage than to remain outside it physically whole. Psychological damage can block his or her entry into the matrix shifts that are to come. They do not load him or her with concerns that can register only as anxiety. Because she or he is allowed his or her own evaluations, such power of decision gives a corresponding power to act. And she or he responds to the instant unfolding of the moment as it is. The child, roughing in a world knowledge, wanders without rhyme or reason and she or he plays she or he has no goals other than the moment and no other time exists. To the child, the time is always now. The place is always here. The center is always me. For this is the way a world knowledge is structured. At the same time, the parents institute an underlying strata of order. They give him or her four walls of thou shalt nots that are reasonable, unvarying and consistent. These boundaries mostly concern personal relations. She or he knows exactly where she or he stands in relation to his or her parents, what they allow, what they do not allow. She, is not she or he is not faced with ambiguity or indecision. No reasons are used with the pre-reasoning child. Over here, it becomes important. Many times a parent will first say no and then they'll child and then they'll agree. This is what creates a problem. Here they have to understand no means no and any amount of fretting and fuming will not change the decision. No reasons are used with the pre-reasoning child in the expectation that she or he will grasp adult logic. Reasons can fill their conversations with him or her but not their communications or directives. If correctives are needed, they are concrete. The parent picks the child up firmly and removes him or her from the bounds of transgression. They let him or her know without apology that boundaries are to be observed. The single word no suffices if the parent is absolutely consistent in his or her own mind, free of ambiguity about his or her actions, confident, decisive and expecting full compliance. Firm boundaries give strength to the bond and clarity to those areas open for exploration. The child clearly registers the parent's power of decision and their confidence in their decision. She or he feels bonded to strength. She or he accepts their boundaries and restrictions without frustration or hesitancy because she or he is geared to take use from them and their decisions are in keeping with his or her intent. Anger may nevertheless occur. Anger in the child results when she or he is thwarted in intent. Intent has no logic, only drive. Frustrated in his or her immediate drive, and she or he has no time except now. The child wishes to remove the obstacle blocking him or her. Anger thus subjects the child to a peculiar and nearly unresolvable stress. His or her innate anger reaction over restriction by a parent is this non-logical desire to get rid of the parent as obstacles, to get him or her out of the way. Immediately, this very reaction touches on or triggers the child's equally great dread of abandonment. That is, if the child's anger were to succeed, his or her parents would disappear and she or he would indeed be abandoned. Such a split between drives, the one for bonding, the other for exploration, creates unresolved stress that feeds back into the anger until the state of anger eclipses all its origins. So the child must learn that his or her anger cannot in any way upset the bond. When his or her drive for exploration clashes with the parent's responsibility for his or her physical safety, or the order and well-being of the family as a whole, 
and his or her frustration of intent plays into anger, the child must learn that she or he can express this anger without threatening the bond. Not that anger is to be let it all hang out slackness. Emotions are not at stake. The bond is. The child must learn that his or her spontaneous reaction of anger as a kind of death wish towards the parents can be expressed without being realized. She or he must discover that mother will not disappear if she or he beca does become angry with her. The child's own anger is the most explosive force she or he knows. Second, only to mother's anger. She or he must learn that not even the destructiveness of anger can destroy or weaken the bond. And it is just as imperative that she or he learn that mother can express her anger towards him or her without in any way upsetting the bond. It is impossible for parental frustration not to flare up. The child, living in the unconscious of the parent, senses every volatile emotion, no matter how incidental or even whether expressed. She or he interprets unexpressed anger as potential anger the parent holds towards him or her and she or he interprets their anger as she or he does his or her own, as a desire to remove the source of the anger. To the child, unexpressed unexpre parental anger means that they are suppressing or curbing his or her own abandonment, his or her own removal. She or he may suspect that their anger is suppressed and hidden because the bond cannot withstand that anger expressed openly. His or her bond is then threatened and anxiety will result. She or he will start dividing his or her energy between intent and the need to try to strengthen the bond. She or he will be all the more afraid to express angers and frustrations for fear of breaking a suspect bond. And a combination of bottled up fear, rage and anxiety will result. So the mother expresses her momentary irritation freely and openly. She tells the child exactly when she is angry, why and how angry is matter of fact, non-apologetic terms, and then immediately re-establishes the bond in every way by holding, body molding, eye contact, smiling and soothing sounds. A playful acceptance of the anger after it has been clearly expressed lets the child know that the anger is what can be made to disappear, that personal power holds sway even over the most destructive of forces. The most threatening of stresses can then relaxes within the bond because the child knows that no power on earth can threaten the bond. With this freedom from anxiety and confidence in his or her source of power, the child moves into an autonomy suitable to his or her stage of development. Soon, she or he can leave the mother freely and enter adventures on his or her own because she or he is sure of power and absolutely certain that she or he can return to the matrix without questions. She or he is in effect carrying the matrix with him or her and the mother is free of direct dependency for longer and longer periods. She is never saddled with a clinging, fretful child. The mother risks her child because she knows that she has no choice except to trust the life process. None of us can guarantee ourselves our next heartbeat, nor can we guarantee the child's. The need to protect the child without crippling him or her forces the parents to make decisions. Because the mother bases her response on the life process, not on some jury out there, she exercises prediction and control within her capacities and relinquishes control to the flow of things when she reaches her limits. She allows minor hurts if need be. She knows that the child must discover through sensory interaction the cause and effect of the principles of governing the world. She avoids the temptation to use verbal commands or descriptions as barriers between the child and interactions. She will surely caution after against burn fire burning. But if a minor blister must result from his or her insistence on sensory exploration of what she means, she will allow just that if it can be done with, within sensible limits. She will label the experience with the single word 
spot as a future queue, but she does this without loading the word with any value because the child would register that as an anxiety value. Above all, she will not load, load his or her action with the guilt of I told you so, which is an attempt to assuage her own guilt, something this mother does not suffer. Nor does she load him with or her with the preconceptions based on next time listen to mother, which is an accusation of wrongdoing. She knows the child has done nothing but follow intent. She gives a value-free name label for his or her encounter, encounter and she allows the child to make his or her own evaluations of experience through his or her own concrete learning. If she uses that word hot again in reference to some event, the child will take cues from her readily enough and without anxiety. Hot will take its place in the scheme of things as naturally as the bad taste of the bitty stick. The world knowledge that is structuring within the child has nothing in common with adult world knowledge. The word gravity has no part in the biological plan. It is a cerebral kind of term. But fall down, go boom, is the body's knowing about the world, a primary concept about world-person interaction. Gravity is an abstract theory of adult thinking, an idea about relations, not the relations themselves. The biological plan needs the actual interactions between physical body and earth because that is how the brain hologram clarifies its picture of the world hologram. And as we shall see in chapters 16 and 17, the creative knowledge that opens at age 7 can unfold only out of this concrete body knowing. Abstract ideas about any of the child's world relations are not appropriate at this stage and are specifically damaging if given to the child in the exception that she or he can incorporate them into his or her logic. The period of roughing in is the great period of language development. The child is one passionate query. What's that mom? Mama, what's that daddy? She or he rushes about in his or her excited exploration pointing, asking for a name for every item she or he encounters, every phenomenon she or he experiences. The name given in answer to the question registers in his or her mind brain as one of the concrete properties of that thing or event. The name does not stand for the event. The name is in no way distinguished in the child's mind from the thing or event itself. The name enters into logical feedback as a component part of the event, exactly as its smell, taste, touch and sight do. The name becomes an integral, structural part of the brain's concept of that thing or event. So over here it becomes important, you know, whenever you are talking to the child, you need to be very clear about what you are telling the child. If you don't know something, then it is better to tell the child, I don't know, we can look it up rather than give him some information which is not correct as far as being correct is concerned. Yeah, just a thought came in my mind. Now in our world in India, especially we have two languages that we speak with, one regional, Hindi, Bengali or whatever, and one English. So when we are naming an object for a child, it can become confusing for the child, right? Sometimes you use you say in Hindi and sometimes in English or Bengali or Tamil or whatever. How does well, that work? No, you can tell the child that in Hindi this is the word and in English this is the word. I'm okay. In, in, okay. In my view at least. Okay. Uh, sorry to interrupt. Uh, see, my granddaughter, she's four years old. So we are teaching her uh, both uh, English and Tamil. So she's able to understand and you know, speak. Yeah. Yeah. So actually we have to explain the child in the best possible way that is possible for us. And we must acknowledge if we don't know something. This is what I have got over the years. Remember that the newborn infant synchronizes body movements to speech used around him or her, that adults still mirror speech in micro movements and that each person has a distinct repertoire of such synchronizations. 
Speech is a body process to the child, particularly during this roughing in period. It is a body knowing, no more learned than breathing or seeing. Speech is completely concrete to the child, directly connected with the tangible physical world, which includes his or her body. Ask the two-year-old to say the word hand and she or he will move his or her hand as she or he says the word. Ask the child just to speak the phrase sit down without moving. She or he will sit down as she or he speaks the phrase. Words, word and act are synonymous to the child because speech is a concrete body process, a physical response of musculature. Just as his or her brain structures its concepts by in internalizing physical interactions with the world, the brain incorporates speech as part of this process. Speech has no abstract qualities to the child and his or her mind-brain cannot process information extracted out of the concreteness of his or her actual world moment. His or her brain can process only what registers through tangible sensory experience. This concreteness of language holds throughout childhood and must still be acknowledged in the eight or nine year old. Alexander, Lu Alexander Luria relates an experiment that clearly shows both the power of speech as a body coordinate and the child's inability to process abstractions. Three and four year old children were given a rubber bulb to press whenever a light came on and release when the light went off. The task was simple enough, but the children were unable to do it, no matter how many times they were instructed or how the instructions were devised. So the experimenter started shouting go when the light went on, at which point the children squeezed the bulb correctly. The word go coordinated their body response to the light stimulus. Then the experimenter had the children give themselves a signal go with their own voices when the light went on. The coordinations took place splendidly. They synchronized their muscular response to the light stimulus through the mediation of their own commands. The next part of the experiment is even more vital to this discussion and gives insight into a critical problem in parent-child relations because it clearly emphasizes the child's inability to process abstract information. The experimenter tried explaining the experiment to his next group of three and four year olds. He told them how to approach the problem. He gave simple clear directions, showed them the bulb to press and the light to watch, told them when to shout go and how to respond to their commands. The children were completely incapable of responding. Then he made a much more detailed and thorough explanation with examples and examples. Why not watermelon? It's so good. No watermelon. Papa juice. The children were completely incapable of responding. Then he made a much more detailed and thorough explanation with examples and models, carefully rehearsing the operation for them. Again, they were incapable of following the instructions. No matter how varied, ingenious and clever his instructions, each experiment fa failed when he gave the children their instructions in abstraction, outside the immediate context of the situation itself. The children could only grasp the nature of the experiment and respond when he gave them their instructions one step at a time in the immediate context of the event itself. They had to have the rubber bulb in their hands to grasp the complexities of squeezing it. See the light go on with that bulb in their hands in order to make the connection. Be told to say go at the instant of the light's actual flashing in order to complete the circuitry. The reason is simple. The child's thought process is his physical action. When the child is not acting, he is not thinking. In the adult sense of that term, the brain patterns a new ability as the child acts out the new actions that ability requires. The new ability is first roughed in by a kind of muscular response. The completion of the various parts of the task fills in the details. Then there is a practice that smooths out the connections and allows variations. To make sense to the child, information, instructions and demands for obedience 
must correspond to the child's available touch, smell, sight and muscular movement. Once an activity is learned through instruction, the words of that instruction are internalized along with all its other movements. But this internalization can result only from an exterior sequence of muscular acts according to the cycle of competence. From the outside in is the rule. And as long as the parent also remembers appropriateness that a maneuver must be in service of the child's intent, learning can be quick, efficient and early. So the mother of the ma magical child responds to WhatsApp mama with the name asked for, no more as many times as needed. She does not load the request with an encyclopedic dissertation in order to make the child smarter, quicker than anyone on the block. She does not load his or her request with all the peripheral notions and descriptions that adults stagger under all the semantic undertones and overtones that trigger our many anxieties. Understand the distinction here. In daily life, she exposes the child to as much language as possible. Parental conversations are vastly over his or her head yet appropriate. But in no way do the parents err by carrying this over into communications of a learning or instructional nature. When the mother uses words to instruct the child, she uses words in a straight way, no baby talk, yet no abstract adult talk. She keeps to words available to the child's concrete touch, sight, hearing, smelling. So, you know, when we talk in that garbled baby tone to babies, it's actually not a good thing. She uses imitation for instruction or explanation as much as possible. She shows him or her one point at a time and then she or he performs that one point with the mother's physical guidance and any concrete words appropriate. The mother does not give two instructions in succession. She gives each point and goes through the act of out, through the acting out of that point with the child before proceeding to the next point. She never moves to the next point until the child has grasped the first with his her bodily response. If she wants the child to learn to put on socks, she joins him or her in the roughing in of the procedure. This, the, their hands are together in the movements, one step at a time, with no quick movements. The mother knows that a learned activity connected with or initiated by a verbal command Put on your socks ushers in specific physical entrainment of the same nature as trying to get the child to say sit down without his or her actually sitting down. Once initiated, learn physical entrainment such as putting on a socks when asked must play themselves out completely. Once such a complex of coordinated movements has been conceptualized in the brain, learned, it can be enacted only as a completely interrelated coordination. The brain cannot break up the entrainment. To do so, the child would have to be able to stand outside his or her own action objectively, which is a logical action of a very high level. For instance, the mother asks the child to put on his or her socks. Now that she or he has learned how, she then notices that the youngster is busy putting on dirty socks when she meant the nice clean ones laid out on the bed. She cannot then countermand the first order in midstream. Oh no, put on these clean ones here. Handing him the clean ones and expect him to comply. This is not possible because the child's brain will not have been able to process the verbal information for much the same reason that she or he could not as an infant both suck on the nipple and focus his or her eyes at the same time. A new entrainment absorbs the total system. Once started in the learn, learned chain of events, his or her system is locked into the directing of muscular responses in a manner so totally integrated that once begun, the entrainment must play its complete role. His or her brain cannot attend the other order because it has not processed the words. The child will have to be allowed to put the dirty sock all the way on before his or her conceptual system is free to process something else. 
even if she or he could comprehend the mother's counter commands, she or he could not reroute the whole complex of mind muscular coordinations. Only when the first socks is on, dirt and all, can she or he hear what the mother has to say. She or he must then be told to take the dirty sock off. Of course, mother can explain then and show him her clean sock. Then and only then can she or he follow the new command and take the dirty sock off, which calls for nearly as involved a complex as putting it on required. Only when the dirty sock is off in his or her system, clear for the final command, put the clean sock on. Three different commands will have to be given on one at a time and only after the preceding action has been completed. Complicated? No. The real problem is its very simplicity. We choose not to believe such care necessary because we are too careless in too big a hurry to observe appropriateness. The clash that damages the biological plan is the clash between adult logic and the practical intelligence of the child. How long does a physical incorporation of language last? Throughout childhood. Although body language of this simplistic sort seems limited, it serves the child needy, so child's need perfectly because that need is to structure a knowledge of the actual world, not of the adult verbal descriptions of that world or adult ideas about it. Ordinarily, the child completes the roughing in of his or her knowledge of the world at about three years of age. His or her interactions have built a critical mass of these rough concepts. His or her logical feedback then begins to order this mass into some coherent form. His or her exploration of the world has been random and haphazard because the intent was for undifferentiated content without value. Now, with something like 80% of his or her concrete body knowing about the world formed, she or he is ready to fill in the details of this rather scattered and unfocused world map. We can carry on. Filling in the details. Watch the three-year-old walk into a luncheonette. Does anyone have to say anything for the last chapter? All good, so we can proceed. Okay. Watch the three-year-old walk into a luncheonette where all the counter stools are held as skelter. She or he will want to straighten them out, put them in some order. That is what his or her logical feedback system has now begun to do with those helter-skelter concepts about the world that she or he has amassed in two years of roughing in. His or her drive for undifferentiated content now shifts towards a preliminary ordering of knowledge into rough groupings, even as she or he continues the drive to amass world knowledge. This ordering out of chaos has its precedent in the stranger syndrome which was noted at about six months of age, when the child's logic put together all available information about mother and ended with a stable knowledge of her. The preliminary ordering at age three is concrete. It concerns the tangible effects of the immediate world and the mother responds to the child's new need, the more formal structuring of physical boundaries, more routines, more order, along with increased openness for exploration. The passionate WhatsApp mama continues as the building of a reference library of name continues. At the same time, a new kind of query begins. Why? What for? The mother knows his or her ability to process abstract reasoning is still years away. She knows the child is not asking for reasons in the adult sense and that adult reasons may in fact be quite inappropriate to his or her stage of development. Remember the three and four year olds trying to press the rubber bulb with when the light went on? They could not learn at all from abstract instructions. They could only process references to what they could touch at the time. When the child can process in response to the quest for why and how are the answers, 
are answers relating to what touches him or her, his or her concrete personal life experiences and not incidentally his fantasy life, an issue discussed in chapter 15. Because his or her language grasp is enormous by age 3 or 4. A parent is liable to think that this gives him or her a logical ability to process adult verbal logic. By age four, the child's language structure, syntax, and general ground rules are essentially complete. But this is not at all the same time as the logical structure found in adult thinking. The mother of the magical child knows linguistic competence precedes logical competence by years. Four-year-old logic is a world of its own. She responds to her youngster's queries with simple, concrete answers available to his or her logical grasp, which means available to his or her sensory contact or fantasy repertoire. She is not betraying the child's intelligence or intellectual growth in answering the question, where does the sun go at night with behind the trees to sleep? If she or he asks why the sun goes out at night, the mother might answer, so we can see the moon and stars. Half the children's stories handed down are fantasy answers to such questions. The truth or falseness of the mother's answers or explanations are not always the primary concern. Appropriateness to the child's current state of logic is a more important issue. The mother knows that radical shifts of logic will later re reorganize every meaning now forming in the child's mind. If she or he wants to know where the sun goes at night, the mother does not launch into a dissertation on planetary motion. She responds to the child's practical intelligence and his or her need for ordinary and a logic of relations. These groupings are quite temporary. The purpose is not to grasp adult reasons, but to learn to form groupings of experience that make sense in the child's pre-logical world. These are exercises of his combinational logic and the exercises must use the tools of mind and materials available. One falls down and goes boom and skins a knee. The force of gravity and the principles by which things hold together are understood quite well as skinned knee. The ball falling back down, the marble going down the drain, Around age 7, the child's creative logic, able to interact and change aspects of the matrix, will develop out of his or her body knowing the fact that fall down goes boom. His or her body knowing that fire burns and hot means don't touch will never need articulating for the unfolding of his or her miraculous logic lying in store. His or her body knowings will be the materials out of which and on which his or her first great movements of abstract thought will be based because the growth of intelligence is from the concrete to the abstract, not the other way around. To the child between three and six or so, everything simply is. Adult criteria and child criteria have almost no points in common. Can't you remember being seriously puzzled over adults buying smelly cigarettes? and such things instead of using all the money for candy, ice creams, and milkshakes, as you would certainly do when you were grown. The mother does not impose criteria that are appropriate to a larger, later stage of development on her child and so never questions his or her statements. The statement's content is another matter. If the child reports that she or he saw an enormous tiger in the bushes, she accepts his or her statement. The fact lies in the statement, not necessarily in its content. The truth or falsity of the statement is a different issue and very seldom the one to be dealt with. For example, if she or he says he saw a snake in the bushes and they live in the country, the child might be making a different order of statement. You may exclaim, aha, there is con here is contradiction. If you want the child to construct a true knowledge of the world, how can you possibly avoid teaching him the difference between childhood imaginings and the way of things out there in the tooth and claw world? These are good and sensible objections. In an age of crumbling social order, where even basic survival has become doubtful, how could one argue with such questions? 
Part of the issue is when and how are such issues learned and brought into practice. I am appealing for observance of a certain order of unfolding in the child and an appropriateness of materials. Of materials. If our century has taught us anything, it should be that we cannot legislate ethics. The child's problem lies not with such high level qualities, but with the far more fundamental and approachable problem of adult child interaction. The issue is that adult reality experience is a different order of logical structuring from child reality. The other part of the issue is that child reality needs no correcting by adult reality. It needs only the chance for proper maturation. Adult experience is not, not of the one-for-one -one correspondence with the world that the child knows and has few points of similarity at all with the child's fantasy or reality. Adults view the world through the, an elaborate web of propositions inherited from ages past, unconsciously adopted as they grew up, rigorously learned in school and all assumed to be absolutely true and necessary for reality adaptation survival and social acceptance. Adults see the world through this complex grid of abstract ideas in much the same way that the child sees his or her reality through a web of fantasy play. When we realize that our concepts organize information into perceptions regardless of the nature or source of those concepts, we then realize how thoroughly our experience changes as we structure abstract notions about the world later in life. Our current state of affairs is always the result of our current state of ideas about things, our body of knowledge. Our current reality is always the expression of our ideas superimposed on the world as it is. World plus idea equals our adult reality experience, which we come to think of as the world itself. We have no final way of being sure what a child's actual perceptions are any more than we have for each other as adults. Perceptions are the end result of concepts and concepts change. But we do not have clues to the child's world perceptions. The art of children between the ages of two and six is remarkably alike all over the world. After age seven, a child's drawings begin to show an increasing and decided cultural influence and so vary widely. Perception is not a very accurate index of what is out there because different perceptions can form from the same source of stimulus and the same perceptions can form in people in response to different stimuli. Surely we can look in the bushes to see if a tiger might happen to be there but we cannot reconstruct the child's interior conceptual context of that moment to find out what was going on. Imagination means creating images that are not present to the senses. All of us exercise this faculty virtually every day and surely every night. Illusion, fantasy, hallucination all follow, fall into the same category of verbal explanation and explain nothing at all. These terms lead us away from, not towards, the key issue. Stimuli can be elicited within the brain's own huge network of concepts for the rhythmic firing and patterning almost never ceases and can produce perceptions and have no external source. As we grow older, we learn or presume we learn which of our experiences are legitimate indications of what is out there. About our only criterion for this distinction is consensus and this opinion is what we learn as our culture's body of knowledge. The issue of childhood fantasy and imagination will be discussed in chapter 15 because the whole crux of human intelligence hinges on this ability of mind. Here it is enough to say that nature has not programmed error into the genetic system and that the child's preoccupation with fantasy and imagination is vital to development. Frances Wicks related the story of a nine-year-old child brought to her in serious psychological difficulty. He was confused, disoriented, extremely fearful, 
unable to attend school, unable to learn or take part in any ordinary life. His parents were well-educated people who had given their child every advantage, stimulus and nurturing to their best knowledge. They were practical, no-nonsense people who determined that their child should not be saddled with the wealth of silly nonsense that seems to plague most children. They were scrupulously honest and never lapsed into any of the convenient and lazy social lies with which careless parents fend off their children's queries. They did not respond to questions of birth with stork tales. They explained carefully the full mechanism of reproduction and birth complete with pictures and diagrams. There were no cheap fantasy tales of Santa Claus, fairies or guardian angels at night. They chose the literature to be read to him with care, making sure it was sensible and informative. He responded splendidly, an articulate, sober, thoughtful and precocious child. His conversation at five was astonishing. The thing began, things began to come apart when he was about seven. Progress seemed to stop. Kindergarten had been a failure. He had been unable to be separated from his parents and the situation grew steadily worse. He had serious night terrors and grew thin and frail. Finally, a childhood schizophrenia was a sad diagnosis. After a year or so of unsuccessful attempts at treatment, he was taken to Wits, who settled down to find the root of the trouble. She gave the child the lead and took her cues from him, as children had taught her to do. Diagnosis took almost no time at all, and Vic's prescription was a shock to those most literate and sensible people. Read to this child, she said, hours and hours a day. Read him nothing but fantasies, fairy tales with wild imaginative stories. Throw in all the talking animals, cloud castles, little people, magic and mystery, signs and miracles, Santa Claus and angels, fairy godmothers and wonderful wizards. Saturate him with the unreal and improbable. Make up stories for him and enter into fantasies with him. Talk to the flowers with him. Converse with the trees and wind. Animate every nook and cranny of his life with imaginary beings. Within a few months, the child was well in school, catching up, healthy and happy. Growth of intelligence had stopped around five because a vital ingredient was missing. Now the missing piece of his developmental machinery had been filled in or perhaps simply allowed to operate as nature intended. A way for ordering into meaningful relations a rather meaningless and haphazard world. The child's need is to be a child. Forcing him adult thought produces a form of premature autonomy. Even when that adult thought is cast in terms the child can grasp. Surely we can trick the growing system into walking before crawling. But that young system will reel about drunkenly and crash headlong to the amazement and heartbreak of those parents so delighted that they had produced a child wonder. Okay, I think we can stop here now. It's uh, 3.33. Anyone wants to make any comments? I think it's pretty clear. Okay, just one thing. Yeah. Yeah, I'm just going to just the last one. What kind of child uh, was it for whom the stories had to be read out? Generally, any child, any kid of that age? No, no, because the parents were very, very upright and they used to, you know, stimulate the child, overstimulate the child. The child uh -huh. went from a, uh, did not really synthesize the previous matrix, where the fantasies of the child works. I understand. understand? Yeah, now, the okay. child had missed that stage. Uh -huh. okay. When they went to the therapist, the therapist told the parents, that you need to allow the imagination of the child to work, to reconnect and reintegrate right, right. with that matrix which was mixed, um, which was missed. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah. Anyone else? Anything? No, no it was pretty clear. Yeah. Uh, four o'clock. Four o'clock, we are meeting for meditation.
ओके ओके राम राम जी राम 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 थैंक यू श्री मंगला यस थैंक यू श्री मंगला थैंक यू श्री मंगला यू आर रीडिंग वेल वेरी वेल हां हां थैंक यू थैंक यू थैंक्स निकेत थैंक्स श्री मंगला थैंक यू थैंक यू थैंक यू श्री मंगला Okay see you all then bye yeah bye